Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Best Practices for Managing Irregular Operations and Schedule Changes. Hi, I'm Judy Howard, Arts Manager of Customer Experience and Operations, and I'm really excited this afternoon to introduce our uh, guest speaker, Paige Blunt. She's the uh, Arts Manager of Industry Relationships and Airline Retailing, uh, comes to us with many years of a lot of experience in that area. Um, and Paige leads our debit memo working group and over the past couple of years has worked really hard um, with a subgroup of the debit memo working group and their primary focus has been to address and come up with best practices for irregular operations and schedule changes. And that group has been combined with agents, airlines, and GDSs and they've put a lot of hard work into coming up to these best practices best practices, which Paige is going to go over to you on our session this afternoon. Um, but before I turn it over to Paige, um, we want, of course, everyone to get the most out of this session as they possibly can, and I'm sure you have questions. So we want it to be interactive. To ask questions, everyone will be muted through the session. However, you can go to your control panel, type in your questions, and we'll get to as many as we can um, in today's webinar. We have a lot of people um, on this uh, session today, so it might be difficult to get to all of them, but don't worry. We will be sending up a follow-up documentation that will address everyone's questions. Or if ones need to be uh, followed up individually, uh, Paige and her team will do that. We're also going to allow you, if we can, again, there's a lot on the um, call today, but if we can, um, we're going to give you the option to raise your hand um, where you will be able to directly ask your question. So in order for that to be successful, you just take yourself off of self-mute, um, and I will unmute you and mute you back. So, okay, so either write your questions in, raise your hand, um, and without further ado, Paige, we're gonna turn it over to you. Thanks, Judy, I appreciate it. Uh, Thanks, Paige. Hello, everyone. Hello. Wanted to uh, say, you know, welcome in this lovely uh, COVID-19 era that we're in. Hopefully everyone's healthy and safe and as well as your families. Um, to get started today, we want to talk a little bit about uh, the re release that we just put out in uh, April for the recommendations for managing schedule changes. These will include IROPs, uh, irregular operations, as well as regular schedule changes. And uh, the group uh, put together, uh, you know, was working together for about two years to get this document together, meeting uh, in person, on the phone, there were agent-only calls, there were uh, airline-only calls, and then we came together, um, usually uh, in person, to be able to really collaborate and vet uh, solutions. So if we can move to the next page, please. Um, I wanted to be sure that everyone is aware uh, of what, what the big deal about um, these schedule changes is. Really what we were trying to do and when we started the debit memo working group back in 2013 is we were trying to find ways to streamline the process of debit memos and reduce their volume. Um, there was a lot of uh, memos out in the marketplace and um, ARC put together a group of you know, competitors truly airlines, agents, and GDSs into a room, which really hadn't been done before, to really uh, start to have conversations about the best way forward. That group has evolved over the years, and as you probably are aware, back in 2018, we released a best practices for debit memo resolution. That was, uh, again, another group that was put together uh, of all of the stakeholders that are involved in the, in the debit memo process. Those are also found on our artcorp.com website where you can access those at your leisure. Now we also have a steering group for the debit memo working group which prioritizes really the focus of the entire group. And in um, 2018, there was a need that seemed to look start looking at how many ways that we could potentially try to standardize or at least give best practice to standardize um, some of these really agreed difficult problems for our customers uh, when it comes to a schedule change or an irregular operation. We had a great champion, um, Debbie, Debbie Todd Eckleff from Expedia was our champion. She came from with an extensive background in operations and really provided some great guidance and information regarding the different uh, different processes that airlines were taking at the time. 
Uh, one thing that we are trying to do with this uh, particular document is to be sure that everyone understands that it's it's a best practice. This is the way, and you know, if we could all do everything the same way, this is the way would be best. Now, we want to uh, be sure that we bring together uh, understanding that we are going to talk about some very specific items in this webinar today. I will not be covering the entire document. It's much too expensive for an hour. And, uh, but I would welcome you to come out to ARC's website. Uh, if you want to, you could put it in the search uh, bar for uh, schedule changes. This will come up for you. As well, we will give you the actual web address in, when we send the uh, recap of this particular meeting out. Uh, one other thing is, is that COVID-19 has really highlighted the need for some definite uh, standardization and, and streamlining the processes for these kinds of changes. I'm sure you all are all very, very aware of the need for these, so we're going to keep going. Next slide, please. Let's talk a little bit before we get started kind of about what best practices are. They definitely, as I said, are guidelines. They are not going to be enforced by ARC. ARC does not mandate any kind of change like this. This is a decision by agents and airlines. Um, we hope that they will be adopted or at least begin to be adopted by airlines when they are you know, running through their, their policies for schedule changes and irregular operations. And we hope that agencies are able to do the same thing as well. We will try to benchmark uh, adoption uh, from would be a, a survey type of uh, situation probably in about six to nine months. But just please be aware that we may not be able to really give an accurate indication of how well uh, these have been adopted because of the nature of the situation that we're in today, especially with COVID-19. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> Let's look at just kind of some of the different pieces that we uh, are, began our journey to look through and to try to find ways to streamline our process. Where one focus, we were trying to create some consistency for the entire industry. We we're trying to establish some standardization through efficiency. Uh, obviously, reducing operational costs, both for agencies and airlines, is key. Um, and also, looking to really find ways to increase customer satisfaction and retention. Agencies and airlines have the same customers. They're just coming to, e to you via different avenues. And if there's a, a problem, uh, the agency as well as the airline uh, can be seen as, as having responsibility uh, from the customer viewpoint. Next slide, please. So we're going to be looking, these are the six major areas that we cover in this document. Uh, obviously, there are some debit memo related issues out there that, that have to do with, with the schedule change and how they're being uh, processed by the agency. But I think one of the key pieces that we're looking at is the customer experience. As I said, when, when you are a customer and you're utilizing a travel agency to fulfill your ticket needs for your trip, there you're looking at the agency as an extension of the airline. And when there's a problem, when there's just, let's say, an irregular operation and the flight uh, is delayed and there is uh, maybe an offering for a next flight you know, four hours later, um, the customer, if they're not serviced well, um, could potentially take that as a problem from the agency side. Even though the agency had nothing to do with the actual regular operation, there is that perception. So what we want to do here is to really give customer, uh, customers the ability to be, we want to be transparent to them, we want agencies to be transparent, airlines as much as possible. We want the entire, ecosystem of the irregular operation or schedule change process to function seamlessly. We're going to talk about some GDS communication of changes. Many airlines are not utilizing the GDS to communicate schedule changes, which causes a lot of downline problems for agencies, especially because they built in automation to manage these queues. And when there are different types of communication coming to an agency, it does temper their ability to work quickly and efficiently and effectively for the customers. 
Another one we're going to really be looking at this today during our call is about some standard definitions around some different processes within uh, this the regular operation process. The reason is is it because airlines have multiple ways to define things, and agencies are then tasked to figure that out based on the airline that they're looking at a ticket for. So we're going to try to add some clarity to some of these definitions. And then also, definitely, we're going to work on how to manage the customer expectation. We don't always tell the customer exactly kind of what's happened, and it leaves them in the dark. And so we're going to show kind of some opportunities to be able to give them some more information rather than keeping them, you know, sitting in the dark. Next slide, please. And here, let's talk about the, just the overview. Next slide. Uh, the first one is the definition. The definition of this, uh, as we talked about, there are a lot of different definitions out there for uh, ways to say this falls into an IROP or this falls into a schedule change. And looking at these reasons, uh, there's obviously a very uh, robust vol vol volume of different types of reasons. Airport conditions, inclement weather, um, crew availability, you know, a, a, an aircraft problem, a, a mechanical issue, those are all really should be defined as IROPs, uh, irregular operations. Something about market supply and demand, changes to, you know, I'm flying to this city today and, and I'm not going there tomorrow. Um, any kind of operational issue, maybe something like uh, along the line of the MAX, the 737 MAX. Um, a pandemic, that, that is a big reason for a schedule change. Um, and then there are many, many others that haven't been identified here directly. Next slide. So looking at, at this, there was a concern about kind of the degree of change or the level of impact to the customer, to the ticket, to the flight. And so when you're looking at some of these things, maybe the you know, equipment change. A customer is very, many customers really like to have, you know, this is my seat, 12D, that's my seat today. And then if we have to change a, a plane or uh, you are you know, upsizing or downsizing that particular aircraft due to whatever reason, um, then the customer now has maybe seat 9D. Well, he doesn't understand why he now has 9D. And there's not a lot of information out there as to why that might occur. So this is one of those kinds of things that we're going to talk about through the document about giving customers a little bit more information, some things to be aware of uh, and look, look for, you know, could there, should there be a, a problem with the flight? Flight numbering change, that's not a big deal, but yet we have the airline is contacting the customer and the agent potentially is contacting the customer, maybe via your app, maybe via an email to say, hey, your flight is no longer number 123, your flight is now number 456. Again, not a big deal, not an impact to the transaction. However, the customers wonder why these things are happening. Next slide, please. Okay, so then let's, let's go and look at some recommended industry de standard definitions. Go ahead, please. Um, the first one is that we're looking really to put some standardized descriptors to some of this language. Uh, again, I was saying that airlines are functioning differently and, and we all totally understand that they are separate entities and they, they don't work together in any of these things. However, there, we are hopeful, this, the focus group is hopeful that we can put some, a little bit of definition uh, and, and descriptor around some of them. Like for instance, the egg regular operation. The group, and let me remind you that the group is made up of airlines, agents, and GDSs. Usually from the airlines, they are people who are in either on the front line or they are in the operational centers of, of the airlines. So they are not people who are in marketing. They're not people who are working debit memos or revenue accounting necessarily. They are people who manage this kind of thing on a daily basis. The agents on the group were a little bit of both. They were working some in the front line, some were in the back office, some were in the operational centers. 
Um, and then the GDS is really those people had a uh, widespread knowledge of kind of how their GDS was managing in certain types of situations. Just a little background for you. So the group here uh, suggested that really the best practice would be to say that an irregular operation is really something that occurs within 72 hours of scheduled departure time. And then conversely, a planned schedule change or a schedule change is really something that occurs more than 47 hours from scheduled departure. Again, we put down here generally, but not always, the airlines are providing information 30 days prior to departure about this. This is more of your general, you know, um, three minute change in the flight departure time or the flight arrival time. Um, small, different kinds of changes that aren't requiring, you know, a, a huge customer service issue. Next slide, please. An exception event. It's really great that so many airlines have worked to really help empower the travel agencies to manage their customers in big situations such as an IROP or a schedule change. And they've offered those in, you know, with different kind of uh, uh, keywords such as the travel notice or a flex event, maybe an exception policy. And again, trying to just be a little more standard, um, the group thought that potentially the word exception event um, could be a, the, the best choice for utilizing this. This would include everything from weather problems, uh, political actions, could be a terrorist action, you know, anything along any of those lines, they felt that this exception event was a good descriptor for those things. Next slide, please. The degree of impact to the customer it definitely has a different definition um, a lot of times depending on who you're speaking with. Um, and it really, uh, that degree many times with many airlines helps to determine what kind of options a, a customer might have when there's an impact to their ticket. So the group here felt that it, the degree of change um, and, and determine the, the flexibility capable for the customer. So let's look at that for the impact, the minor impact would be something as we talked about before, a flight number change, an inventory change, but in the same cabin, maybe an upgrade to a higher cabin. And the major impact would be more of a change to departure or arrival airport. If the customer now was flying into LaGuardia and now has to fly into Kennedy, that might be a problem for them. Um, also, if they have to stop in a city when they had, uh, you know, they were stopping maybe in Charlotte, and now they have to stop in Atlanta. I mean, there, there are just some issues along with that that could be concerning for the customer. So major impact is much more uh, invasive for the customer, and, and minor is very, very minimal. Next slide, please. Booking inventory code. This one is, is kind of different again, according to the airline. Some people are using reservation booking designator. Others class of service, booking code, inventory code. Honestly, you uh, as an airline may have even a different uh, set of, of letters if you want to, uh, that, you, that you call an, an uh, inventory change. And so what we wanted to do here is to try to, again, give some standardized verbiage. Uh, the group felt uh, best that the reservation booking designator uh, should be used when referencing um, the inventory code, the booking designator, Sometimes it's just the first letter of the fare basis, but not always. Again, there are many, many different types of, of verbiage around that. Next slide, please. Judy, are we doing okay? Yeah, Paige, we do have a question that has come in um, that is about, uh, regarding charge back. Um, the question is, I have clients that are charged back, but haven't seen a debit memo yet from the airline. Now the flights are canceled, and I could refund their tickets, but I don't know what to do. Is that anything, um, Paige, that you could help with, or is that something we take offline um, and deal separately with that individual? Well, we can definitely deal with that very specific item offline, but in general, I can give you kind of just an overview. Um, obviously, it's probably not uh, the, the, the direction maybe that you gave your customer to charge back, I would think, um, and that's an unfortunate situation because when a customer cancels the flight for a non-refundable ticket, 
before the airline cancels the flight. That can be a different situation for an airline than uh, if they waited until after uh, the airline canceled the flight. But depending on the airline, you may have, uh, you know, they may have some special circumstances. Um, I'm, like I say, I'm happy to have a com have a e email exchange with you uh, about this specific instance. Um, but yeah, it, it definitely it, it's difficult because right now, um, unless you're going to try to alert your customer to take back the chargeback, there really isn't an opportunity to do anything yet. Okay, great. Uh, and I, like I get, I encourage everyone to either raise your hand and ask your question directly to Paige or write them in uh, here and be following up uh, with any outstanding questions that haven't been answered here today, either individually or can't uh, Paige just said, or um, we'll put out a documentation. So again, ask your questions. Okay, um, next slide, please. As the as you all are probably very aware, being being agents that work with you know 200 airlines uh, a day, um, there is a very broad spectrum of how airlines are communicating schedule changes to you. And uh, ideally, uh, they're utilizing what's already out there, which is the GDS uh, communication tool, which comes from the airline that says, these are the list of all the schedule changes we've made. Uh, maybe there are other kinds of schedule of, of information on some of those uh, transmissions. But really, the GDS uh, schedule change queue is the uh, more standardized way to go. But we know that there are airlines who are asking or who are actually putting uh, remarks in OSI or SSR, saying, hey, this flight is now number 123, not 234, you need to fix your ticket, or leaving three minutes later, or something. Uh, we also have heard that there are definite airlines that are posting bulletins to their websites, which then requires you as an agent to go out, grab that information, and then start to scan all of your uh, trans transactions. Email blasts, in a similar way, you definitely have a manual set of work to be able to go and look for all of those particular uh, affected tickets. Um, and then I have heard that there are even some airlines that are actually calling agencies about yeah, each PNR, uh, and maybe there's some kind of bilateral agreement for just specific communication ways to manage. Um, unfortunately, when we go into some of these more manual uh, opportunities, and thank you for airlines for actually sending the information, but it really impedes agency automation that may be in place if it's not done at the queue level. And so therefore, this focus group is definitely recommending that, you know, anything regarding the IRP and the schedule change that can come on a queue and be communicated before the, the traveler would be going to the airport should be communicated via the GDS at the segment level in normal queue placement with segment status code rules. Uh, this is pretty standard uh, through all the GDSs today. Uh, however, uh, airline adoption is certainly not 100%. Okay, next slide. This, uh, let's talk about the kind of a specific type of uh, uncanceled segment, this HX. And I'm sure this is probably a, a problem for everyone on the phone. Um, when you're, uh, you have a ticket that's uh, been issued, you're confident your passenger's really going to be flying, and then something happens. Either the passenger calls the airline directly to make a change and you're not aware of it. Uh, potentially there's a no-show, maybe there's a cabin upgrade for some reason, or there's um, an unticketed PNR that's canceled with a ticketing time limit expiration. Uh, and maybe it's even a dupe ticket, but uh, there are a lot of reasons and things that happen that cause this HX status. And what it has been, was discussed in our group was that there were, really there was a need for the agency to understand what happened, not just that it happened, but why it happened. Uh, because most agencies do not have insight into changes that the airlines are making. There are some exceptions but most agencies don't have all of the information. So the group felt that it would be helpful to include some sort of, again, descriptor 
in the HX messaging, like you've seen here. There are three examples that we put here, um, IROP upgrade, customer contact, direct. Uh, there are a, a lot, there's a much longer list that's included in our uh, best practice document, uh, which you can, are welcome to go and see for yourself. But there, you get the idea here, giving the agency the information to be able to understand what happened to their ticket and their customer. It's a very large issue. So uh, hopefully uh, this will help to alleviate some of that uh, and give at least some insight for the agent to understand. Next slide, please. And customer contact information. I think there has been a, um, there was a very large initiative by IATA, if you're familiar with IATA, um, to put something in place where they, every airline, or excuse me, every uh, ticket for the customer had to have a customer phone number and email address within the um, SSR message. And we do have a recommendation within our industry agent handbook that says that this should be present at the time of PNR creation. We do not mandate that. That is not, we are not IATA. We do not utilize their passenger agency um, resolutions. We do, however, utilize their passenger service resolutions. And A4A has a, a duplicate set of these resolutions. There are the majority of the passenger service resolutions we do uh, have in A4A. Um, there are a few exceptions, one of them being MCOs, for instance. So there are, but these, this particular resolution or uh, recommended practice that I ought to release um, does not directly affect uh, agents in the U.S. It is uh, our uh, definite desire, though, and that's why we have it in the IAH, that it, we would ask that you put it in there. We are not requiring it. The focus group agreed. Uh, all of the airlines and agents definitely said, this is what we want. We would like for the customer information to be in the PNR. We would like for the uh, airline to be able to contact the customer when there's an irregular operation, if they're faster. Because sometimes there are so many calls being done back and forth between the agent, the customer, the airline, the agency, the customer, that it would just streamline the process if the customer had more information. Now, that doesn't mean, uh, you know, releasing relinquish uh, of, of the ticket to the airline. It, it, that's not what we're looking to do here. We understand there's duty of care reasons why an agency needs to be able to uh, understand and, and be able to control a ticket. But there are opportunities to provide customer service for the passenger with this information in the PNR. Next slide, please. Paige, there are some questions that have come in, okay. so I'm just going to take a moment um, to kind of address a few of these. This one is, if the original destination is Glasgow and the airline routed the passenger to London Heathrow, is it a major change and will a refund be due? Okay. Um, <laughs> To be very honest, I think um, that would be a very, very particular situation it, it, to me. My opinion only, and not speaking for an airline, my opinion would be that that was a pretty major change. There are different islands. Um, but uh, without knowing exactly how that, what that looks like, um, I, I would have to say we're going to have to look at that specifically and offline. I apologize for not being more clear there. Um, I just need to be able to look at it specifically, please. Okay, great. Thank you, Paige. Um, here's another one. Um, do you have a list um, of airlines that have chosen not to alert schedule changes via the GDS via the GDS at the segment level? So we knit, so we know which airlines to watch more carefully. Is that something that this group has looked into, or this, or we already have? It's a good question. Um, I do not have a list like that. The group did not put together that type of list. Um, uh, we discussed that there were airlines that were doing things in many of the ways that I, I outlined, but we do not have a list of these are the ones that are and these are the ones that aren't. I would assume we can definitely, I'm assuming agencies can, you know, kind of you understand which ones are coming to you directly, for sure. Um, and, but the others, there would be no way to understand that the, you know, which, which are doing 
what exactly. I apologize. I don't have that kind of information. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Paige. Um, thought it was a worth a, a worth of ask though. Um, and then let me see. There's a few more coming in. Um, is there any is there any way uh, that all airlines can standardize their means of communicating schedule changes? I think that's probably been looked at with this group. <laughs> and you're smiling. <laughs> I mean, that would definitely be the desire of using the queue and being able to understand and have that if the information flow through your system so that you can effectively work that um, through your, you know, your mid and back office. Um, but it, it, we just don't, we don't have a standard process today. We're trying to move toward that with these uh, best practices. Thank you, Paige. More questions, but I'll let you continue and we can get to some of these as we get farther along. Okay. All right. We're now going to look at kind of managing those customer expectations. Next slide, please. So there's been a lot of, there was a lot of conversation really around reprotection, what agencies can do, what they can't do, um, and just some definite specifics on where some of the big problems lie. Um, one key issue here, of course, was about empowering agencies. Many airlines have, have made great strides in offering opportunities to agencies to you know, really assist their customers. Other airlines have not been quite as, as open about that. Um, but what the focus group really recommends is that there was some sort of online repository where there are current current and up-to-date change policies and processes um, the, where agencies can access these on a airline websites without the need for a password-protected site. Um, understand why there might be need for you know, password protection on many things, but this is not going to be proprietary information necessarily. This is information to help the agencies manage the problems that are happening based on what's happening within the airline. So that is definitely one of the, the large recommendations that has been put out here. Again, some agencies are doing a great job of it, or excuse me, some airlines are doing a great job of it, others are not. And so we would like everyone to try to move toward this type of online uh, capability for agencies to access. And then flexibility. Um, there are airlines out there, as, as I'm sure you all know, that you know, require you to make a phone call or send an email to get some sort of resolution to a schedule change or to a, an IROP that you know, might involve a, another carrier or might involve a downline partner or some of those kinds of things. And it really hampers the agency's one, uh, ability to build the automation, that's a key, but two is the time it takes to wait on hold with a phone call or wait for an email response. Uh, understand that agent, uh, excuse me, airlines are actually getting thousands and thousands of requests. But again, that is where an empowering policy could help the customer move forward with their trip. So definitely looking to um, provide a first call or first touch resolution opportunity here um, and enable uh, the ability to build automation. And then talking about degree of change, uh, we talked about a little bit about that before, but there should definitely be specific instructions about when an agency is allowed to make those reaccommodation changes or, or a refund. One of the big issues that came up, and, and I'm sure most people on the phone can feel this, is that if you have a traveler with a two airlines on the same ticket, and potentially they're not, don't have a JV, um, there are problems if the, maybe the first two segments are one carrier, the second two segments are another carrier, and the first two segments, validating carrier, are flown. Those go fine. Then there is a schedule change or a problem with the second carrier and the second carrier's flight. So an agency contacts the, the carrier where the flight uh, is having a problem, second carrier on the ticket, and they say, oh, no, 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 can't do anything here because the validating carrier makes a policy on how to reaccommodate. So then the agency calls the validating carrier, 
who no longer has any segments on the ticket, and they say, oh, no, no, our segments are already gone. You need to get the policy from the uh, second carrier on the ticket who had the schedule. This is a problem, as I'm sure you're well aware. And really what we're saying with these uh, best practices is that the validating carrier should own the policy for the ticket. Any reaccommodation policy for the ticket is owned by the validating carrier. We uh, really um, ask that the age airlines of the uh, in the group uh, were very agreeable to this, that they uh, said definitely within their JVs that they had um, a lot of those types of processes in place, but that they understood that there were definitely a few that they work with themselves, people in the room were saying it, that potentially might not have had that particular vantage point. So this is the policy that we're asking to be put in place. Okay, next slide, please. Now, I'm talking about this. Go ahead. Oh, no, yeah, you can continue on. I'll wait for questions. Okay. <laughs> talking about the degree of change, um, things that would not be not allow for a rebooking or a refund considered minor, as we talked about a little bit earlier, change in flight, minimal time change, you know, the two or three minutes. But the airline should probably put a impact to the departure or arrival time of X. That X should be defined by the airline. So that you are very aware as an agent, if you know this carrier is uh, it's an under a 10 minute change, you know I I don't I don't need to rebook, I don't need to refund, I'm not allowed to do this, I'm not allowed to do that. These are parameters that need to be set. As well, you know, upgrade, changing the marketing airline, uh, those are definite problems that are happening today. But then the major issues that are coming up, as you can see here, are are much more severe. Um, you know, again, an impact timing would be very helpful. Um, you know, what to do when something happens in a misconnection? Um, there are times when, of course, a passenger leaves, there's an IROP, it's delayed, it's a mechanical issue, they get to the next airport and they can't get on the flight. Um, what happens then? The agency should have clear understanding of what they are or are not allowed to do in those kinds of situations. And again, while some airlines are very clear about policies, many are not. And agents tr are trying to give the customer the best experience possible. They're trying to accommodate. They are not necessarily trying to uh, outwardly you know, avoid fare rules or reaccommodation rules or whatever you have with an airline. They are trying to accommodate your mutual customer. So these are where the group felt that there was need for some sort of policy for agency to be able to see and follow uh, implicitly. Next uh, page, page, we have somebody that has raised their hand. Um, Kathleen, I'm going to unmute you if you can speak up. Kathleen? Justison? Oh, I'm sorry. No, that was a mistake. No, I don't have any questions. Go on. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Don't worry. That's okay, uh -huh. but nice to hear your voice anyway. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, now looking at irregular operations and those customer expectations. Um, again, there, uh, the, the group was hoping that the airlines would provide an opportunity for passengers to manage their online, provide them some options, something to shop and reissue or cancel in the case of involuntary changes that occur within 72 hours. Many, you know, today, a lot of times the customer must go directly to the airline. They must make the phone call. Um, they must, you know, get on their app, something along that line. But there obviously are not a lot of opportunities for the customer to self-service in any way. And so even if the customer can, the agency should be able to do that for them and help them as well. Moving on to the um, group, uh, up to 72 hours, um, the IROP situation that happened, um, most everyone in the group felt that, you know, up to 72 hours, it would be best if truly the airline could manage the situation. And here's why. There are many situations out there where the uh, airline has a much uh, more uh, a better position with other airlines when maybe there's only one flight or two flights a day to a certain location 
and they can't get them there today. The agency certainly isn't going to be able to get them there today because the airline's not going to allow them to just put the customer on another another a carrier. So what the agency, especially in the group, were saying is that if the uh, airline has the opportunity to work with one of their airline partners to get the customer from point A to point B today, instead of making them stay overnight, wouldn't that be a better customer experience? Agree. I, I totally think that that is, is very helpful. Um, don't want to have anyone losing contact with their customer. However, airlines can sometimes get a better accommodation, and, and many times they're hesitant to do so. So that was the recommendation of the group. Moving forward, please. All right, now we're moving into some unique situations, and these are definitely uh, different. Um, if we can uh, go ahead to the next first one. Thank you. Talking about the downgrades in cabins, um, if this is a part of a standard IROP or schedule change procedure, airlines should definitely have some specific information and call outs for this scenario as the, the preferred method. Whether it's the airline contacting the customer or the agent, this is never a good scenario. No one wants to get on the phone with a customer who's now been downgraded from business into economy and potentially not even you know, a, a premium cabinet economy. So there should be some specific information on how airlines want this to be handled. Um, there, are, there are no, is no great way to do this, but there has to be a process. And then minimum connection times, I don't know if everyone has felt this before or not, but uh, I've heard many scenarios in this group about the uh, possibility that there is an airline or a ticket that is uh, connecting in some particular location, and the minimum connection time, we'll just say, is uh, 45 minutes. And so the customer is fine with that connection time. They're not checking a bag. They're just going to take their carry-on, so therefore they're fine. Ticket is issued, and then for travel, just say maybe three months down the road. Then maybe a month later, there's a change to that minimum connection time, and now it's an hour. And so there is no today standard way to give that change of MCT to the agency. Uh, there just isn't, and so there is a problem in that the agency doesn't always know that there has been a change, and therefore the customer either might misconnect, or some airlines have been known to send out debit memos for not uh, ticketing with the correct uh, amount of time in between the two flights. This is an error. This is a problem, and. Before, and the idea would be that before you're issuing a memo for that, the airline should check to see if there were changes to the NCT prior to, or excuse me, after ticket issuance, um, and that there should be all, obviously a better way, and we were not um, uh, very specific in, in telling uh, airlines how to, or asking airlines how they could better make that happen. Uh, but there should be a way to convey that where the agencies could then put some automation in place to be able to go back and review their transactions. Okay, next slide, please. All right, the customer experience. Um, go ahead, please. A couple things here, really trying to set customer expectations. Uh, we've been talking about customer service a lot here and you know if there was an opportunity that airlines and agencies could set up um, some FAQ pages for their customers really on their just on their website saying hey this is what to expect if there's an involuntary change no one wants to anticipate an involuntary change but they happen and so better to have the customer be uh, have the opportunity at least to give themselves some insight into what could happen uh, than to not have anything out there and obviously, then the first call, first touch resolution that is uh, was a, a key theme through our uh, entire group was that it, airlines are encouraged to give policies out there that really allow agencies to help resolve these problems, and so that one call to an agent can then improve that customer experience and get the customer moving and on the way. Okay. Next slide, please. 
Now, just some uh, brief options for avoiding the debit memo. Next slide. Really talk about uh, definitely ways to improve. We are always looking for ways to improve. It's what we do in the debit memo working group. That's what we really have tried to do with these really collaborative sessions with all of the stakeholders that are in this ecosystem. Um, so clear and available published policies, again, not behind a password protected uh, website. Version control is a was a big uh, topic where while some airlines are very good at, especially with their travel policies, their flex policies, their exception policies, whatever you're calling them, uh, that they're putting good version controls in there. Because as the, say, winter storm moves forward, um, there are different cities, different dates, different timelines that are put into place, and you need to be sure that you're able to communicate what was available at the time that your ticket was issued, um, as opposed to two weeks later when it looked very different. So version control was a big factor. Um, minor administrative errors, we really have looked to uh, the airlines to say, you know, if a, if a waiver code is transposed, there's an O instead of a zero. If there's an L instead of a one, you know, could those please be overlooked? There's an opportunity to collect uh, the money in other ways other than those small little administrative things. Um, other other thing is many airlines say put it in your endorsement box. Maybe the agency put it into their tour code box. Um, well, as long as it's available, couldn't it be that that was allowable? Now, I understand there are issues and reasons why some airlines don't want to do that, but it definitely would be the best practice and standard. Um, one thing about the waiver codes that we talk about, and, and I talked about with the with the airlines when we went through this, um, is that there are some policies out there by airlines that they want to put um, the waiver code placement has to be in the endorsement box. Well, that's fine. However, on a refund, there is no <laughs> endorsement box, and so therefore the waiver code placement must be uh, into the waiver code box, which happens to be an IAR. And the way you get it there is there's a, an entry in every GDS to load your waiver code into your PNR, and then that will transmit to IAR, uh, the Interactive Agent Reporting Tool that ARC has, and then you, will, as an agent, will see it there. And then we pass that same waiver code on to the airline on our CAT file. So we need to be 100% sure that we are all understanding that the waiver code for refunds must be in this location and not be in the endorsement box. And there's also things about endorsement box character limitations, the, the space uh, in uh, for, for waivers or endorsements or whatever you're asked to put in there. Uh, that should be something that we need to be looking at uh, as a group. Um, and then some, you know, policy ownership, as I talked about, uh, the reaccommodation policy should definitely be done with the validating carrier. Next slide, please. I think that we're kind of at the end of what I was hoping to share with you all today. I don't know if you all have any further questions. Judy? Uh, yes, Paige, there are questions. I was just reading through some of them. Um, we'll try to get through most of these, and then some will be answered uh, directly to each of you that have asked more specific um, and that require a little more detail. But um, Paige, so bear with me here. Um, in regards to the um, the cancellation segment slide that you did the egg, with the egg, HX, um, is there a way to differentiate who made uh, or who took the initiative to cancel? Meaning, did the passenger call the airline, or was it an airline to cancel, or was it an airline schedule change? Is there a way to tell how that segment got canceled? But for well, the agent to be. Able um, I'm not sure if we can get back to the slide, but um, in the three examples that I did show on the slide and in the IROP um, document, uh, it does list, uh, there are some very specific ver some verbiage on after the HX. Currently, it's just saying this is the segment that's HX, but we have asked to put, you know, like one of the things says customer contacted airline direct for the, uh, there it is, due to customer contact, canceled direct via telephone, uh, the third one down. Um, so th that is really kind of how we are trying to get uh, the airlines to give information to the agents. Uh, great question. Uh, I think 
There are others that are kind of in the same vein as this um, because you want to know whether your customer called or whether there was an IROP because sometimes you don't know. So great question. Thank you. Okay, great page. And we do have someone that has raised their hand. Um, Shannon Castillo, I'm going to call on you and um, hopefully this was not a mistake. <laughs> Shannon, oh, are you still with us? I didn't hit the button myself either. I'm not sure what happened there. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. I'll put you back on mute. No worries, Shannon. Thank you. Okay, Paige, then we have some more here that are um, written in. Uh, I have a concern if the airlines are managing the schedule change in a PNR, will I lose control of that PNR? So if the airline is going in and um, doing schedule changes, does the agent lose control of the PNR at that point? And, and I would have to say one, it's going to depend on the the level of the the issue. Um, but two, there, the other op option is yes, you could. Um, but if if the customer, if if the passenger is right there in front of the agent, um, and they're trying to help uh, accom reaccommodate the customer, um, it would. Um, they are probably able, and then they have already done so within their own tool, to get the customer on the next flight. I understand you don't want to lose control of the of the uh, PNR, um, and if the ticket doesn't have to be potentially reissued, if it's just a reaccommodation or a revalidation by the airline, uh, you shouldn't lose control. However, yes, I do understand that problem, and that is one of the things that the group was very concerned about was the agency losing control, especially when you're trying to provide things like duty of care or downline servicing or any of those other things. So I, I definitely understand your question. Um, and the fact, answer is it, it could be, yes, you could lose control. Not always, but in many situations you could, yes. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Paige. Uh, here's another one. Uh, is there a list that shows the extended expiration dates for unused tickets for each airline? There is a there now. There is not a list of ticket numbers and what that expiration dates look that date looks like. However, ARC does have a website um, under uh, arccorp.com that shows. What, which airlines have extended their ticket validity and how long they have extended it for. Um, you can do a sort on it if you'd like to do it by airline or airlines that have extended to say 24 months or 39 months. Uh, so there, it's a pretty interactive site. It has good information on it. Um, but we don't have anything that says, you know, ticket 123 was issued on January first by airline on airline A and their extension is you know twenty four months. Um, we do not have anything like that, uh, unfortunately. We just have a general data uh, general data point for an airline itself. Okay. Great. Um, and I hope that's helpful for everyone on the, the call here. Uh, this is one page. I don't know if this is in your bailiwick, but I'll ask it. Um, we put in the passenger phone numbers um, in the um, DNR and, in, with, and through the GDS, and sometimes there's multiple contacts for a passenger, but the airline will call and they don't have, they don't see those contact numbers. It, do you have any um, insight into why that would be or how an agent would fix that or put the number in differently? Have you come well, across that before? I'm assuming in that situation that it maybe was in a, out, um, if it was in a kind of the normal place where the contact information is, I would have thought they should be able to find it. Um, and, and that's what kind of leads me to believe, was it in some place other than the normal, the normal location? Um, however, um, I don't know if you've talked to your airline, uh, to that particular airline about it or not, but um, if you could, maybe if you could have that conversation with, if you have a representative for that particular airline and show them where you put it and ask where, you know, where the, the help desk or the reservations people, whoever were trying to contact your customer, um, where they would be looking for it that's different than where you put it. That would be my suggestion. Okay, great. Thank you, Paige. 
Um, especially during this time of COVID, um, there's obviously many schedule changes that are happening. Um, and the question here is, um, again, they're constantly being updated, who is refunding in the GDS and when we have to manage, which ones we have to manage directly. Is there a means for getting more communications from airlines about how they are communi communicating about schedule changes um, to the travel professionals, to travel agents? So I think the question is when all of these schedule changes are happening and flights are being canceled or um, how are the airlines communicating these better or is there a way they can communicate better to travel professionals regarding this? Well, if the airline, I mean, ideally the airline is using the schedule change feature within the GDSs to send that to your queues and tell you that the flight has been canceled. Um, obviously, we all know that that's not happening for everyone. Um, and other than that, or your, you going out and, and searching, um, I don't know of a better way to, to understand that. I know that there at some point, some airlines were kind of zeroing out their flights but had not actually canceled the flights yet. Um, and that was a concern for many agents. Um, but I don't think that that was a, I think that was truly just a, um, a, a product of having so many that they hadn't gotten the flight canceled yet. So unfortunately, no, we do not have a better way of, of in getting the information from an airline to an agent. Uh, the best way I know of is to try to get that through the queue, the schedule change queues that are already in place. That would be a, allow the agencies to utilize the automation to run through all of their PNRs and then potentially alert their customers. Okay. Great. Thank you, Paige. Helpful. Uh, this is a very fundamental question. I should have um, asked this first, but it was way down here at the end. Um, what does IROP mean? I'm sorry, that's irregular operation, meaning, remember, the, there was a problem with a flight um, 72 hours prior to uh, wheels up. And there has been maybe it's a it could be a weather event it could be a mechanical issue um, it could be you know any of, of those kinds of things it's just not like a planned schedule change where you're saying oh we're shifting this flight it's now going to leave at 12 p.m. instead of 11:55. Great, thank you. Hopefully that was helpful for everyone. <laughs> Sometimes we take all of these acronyms for granted. <laughs> um, let me see here. Um, there's a lot of questions. Some we can, um, I think, Paige, you can answer these offline. Um, the, um, the airlines change their policy information for agents constantly. By the time you get the debit memo, that information is updated, not available anymore. Do you have any suggestions on how to protect the agency as far as documentation? That, I mean, that is a great question. Um, that kind of relates back to the version control uh, for policy that uh, I talked about earlier where uh, the group made the suggestion that it, there should be a version control for all policy and there should be an archive function. However, before, if that's not occurring today and this is a problem today, my suggestion is to take a snapshot of the policy or a screen grab of the policy uh, at the time that you did something. Um, if you if your decision to move forward was based on that particular item on their website, um, take a screenshot of it and then hold on to that just in case. I, it's not a great way. I totally understand it is very manual, time consuming, and you probably have so many of these that you just really don't have time to do that. But that would be my only um, uh, way that I could think for you to be able to manage through that. Okay, great, Paige. Um, we're coming to um, the end of our webinar this afternoon. I just want to reiterate, uh, I will be sending all of these question and answers to Paige. She'll either be reaching out with you individually or Paige, if you feel there's some really generic stuff here, we can create a Q&A that we can put on the website. The recording of this session will be emailed out and it will also be on our webinars on demand uh, on our corporate site. Paige, do you have anything else to add before we leave here this afternoon? 
So I just want to say thank everybody for attending. Uh, the focus group was uh, such a great, cohesive group of minds and ideas. Uh, it, I couldn't have definitely done it without them. Um, and I appreciate any you know insight that you all may have for the next one that we look to do. So have a great afternoon and thank you. Thank you, Paige, and I really want to give you a warm thank you for taking the time um, to join us to join us for this session today. A lot of great information, and for everyone um, that participated in the webinar today, thank you. Sorry for those that didn't raise your hand, and we called on you. But um, also, we have two webinars um, coming up that I'd just like to mention real quick. We have one coming up tomorrow, which is Keep Fraud Down and Business Ramps Up. That's tomorrow, um, and that is at 12 noon East Coast time. You should be getting an invitation for that. If you haven't, please reach out to me, jhoward at rcorp.com, and I'll get you that registration. We also have one next week, uh, COVID and Trends in Payment. Um, that's kind of a recap on our, our payment form that happened in June. Lots of good information there. That's next Wednesday, uh, July 29th at 2 p.m. East, Eastern time. If you haven't received that, let me know that as well. But as always, everyone, thank you for joining us. Hope to see you on future sessions. If you have other topics you would like us to uh, have webinars on, please let me know that, jhoward at arcbook.com. Again, thank you, Paige, and thank you, everyone, um, on the webinar this afternoon. Thank you.